Welcome to our operating systems course. In today's lecture we are going to talk about challenges that operating systems have to face and also the related tasks the operating systems have to execute and implement in order to overcome some of these challenges. So when you're talking about operating systems you can have very different views of what an operating system is and provides. So an important part of what an operating system provides is that it provides abstractions. So for a user application that you wrote or that you intend to use, it provides abstractions that are simple enough so that the application itself has less interaction with the raw hardware that it's ultimately running on. So essentially what we're providing as an operating system to our applications are processes. So contexts for applications to run in, virtual memory, so processes don't have to care about the specific addresses they run in or the specific amount of memory they require, and file systems, so processes don't have to care about different disk types or SSD types and how to allocate stuff and even how to protect stuff. Now, in order to enable this, an operating system has to perform a large number of tasks. So some of the most important tasks here are scheduling the CPU between different processes that want to run at the same time, synchronization between processes that need to cooperate or need to use the same resource at the same time, enabling communication between processes that need to cooperate, so-called inter-process communication, and managing the memory of our computer, so memory or even virtual memory management. And in doing this, a number of typical problems show up that the operating system designer has to face. Some of the problems we are going to touch a bit here and go into more detail later in the course are deadlocks, so whenever some synchronization causes problems, and a very important part, obviously, now in this time where everything's connected to the internet, is system security. And then also, new hardware gives us upcoming challenges. So multiprocessor systems are not new, but they're ubiquitous now, even in very, very small systems. So we have to enable our operating system to work with more than one processor and to use this hardware efficiently. And of course, we have large installations like cloud computing systems, which are distributed over the internet. And we want some technologies like virtualization in order to use all these large amounts of servers efficiently and to share them among a large number of different applications. So let's start with the first and one of the impo most important abstractions of an operating system, and this is a process. So like you've seen in the uh, operating systems overview lecture last time, where we've talked about what an operating system is, we can also find very different descriptions of what a process is. So some of these are pretty old already, because operating systems are a topic that's been researched for more than 50 years. So Horning and Randall described uh, in their book Process Structuring a Process as follows. A process is a triple S, F, and lowercase s, where uppercase S is a state space, F is an action function in that space, and lowercase s is a subset of uppercase S, which defines the initial states of the process. The process generates all the computations generated by its action function from its initial states. So this is a pretty formal description and probably not ideal to reuse a capital and lowercase s in the same definition, but anyways. So uh, this already gives us an idea of what a process consists of, a state space. So essentially we not only have some sort of static configuration, but something is changing. So our process may be in one of different states and our process progresses through these states and some of these progressions are valid so this is something we want the program to do when it executes and some of these might be invalid and maybe the operating system should be able to detect this. An action function means we have some sort of execution, we have some sort of control flow going on in that space that actually triggers the transitions between our states and our state space. And this lowercase s defines the initial states of a process. So essentially, for example, when we initialize variables at the start of our process, so we have statically initialized variables or something like this, this all has to be provided by the operating system in order for a process to function. 
And it's also important that this definition says that a process generates all the computations generated by its actions. So essentially, uh, yeah, the action function actually defines everything that's happening inside our pro of our process. And the outcome of this action function is actually dependent on the initial state that was configured when this process was started. All right, let's look at other definitions. Dennis and Van Horn uh, had a paper called Programming Semantics for Multiprogrammed Computations. So where, whenever you see multiprogramming, you see it's a pretty old definition because nobody's using this definition anymore. Uh, so they define a process as a locus of control within an instruction sequence. That is, a process is that abstract entity which moves through the instructions of a procedure as a procedure is executed by a processor. So here, uh, this definition actually determines that a process again has some sort of space, a uh, state. So this state is defined as a locus of control. So locus is just Latin for a place of control. And a process is an instruction sequence. So we have lots of instructions and we're somewhere inside of this instruction sequence. So we've executed a number of instructions already and we're somewhere at a certain point in the execution of our program at a certain point of time. So essentially the process is responsible for moving this program through its own instructions. So the instructions of a procedure, for example, and it does this by enabling the processor to do this moving through the instructions. All right. So a third definition in a book by Habermann, Introduction to Operating System Design, is quite short. So it says a process is controlled by a program and requires a processor to execute that program. So this is very plain and simple. So here uh, there's an emphasis on the fact that a process is related to a program. So essentially the program defines what the process can do over its runtime and that a process is not just an abstract entity, but in order to be successfully executed, a process requires a processor, so the instructions of that program can be executed in the way the process thinks it's a good idea. So all of these definitions are pretty cumbersome still and maybe a bit ancient. So what is usually set in many operating system courses is a very short definition, which covers a large number of exactly the cases that were described before. Unfortunately, we have no idea who actually coined this sentence. But in general, we can say a process is a program in execution. So we differentiate between a program, that's the bits and bytes your compiler and linker generated that are on your hard disk as executable file, exe file in Windows or an ELF file in Linux. And without starting that program, nothing is happening. These bytes lie unchanged on the disk. And only when you start the program by clicking an icon or by typing its name, in your command line, then you actually generate an instance of that program that has a runtime state. So it's no longer static on the disk, but it has something that's changing all the time while it's executing in the memory of your computer. And this is what we call a process. And in order to implement processes, we require a process context to give us more information about the state this process is in. So this especially uh, consists of the memory the process was allocated, so the text segment or code segment, so where all of our instructions live, the data segment, so we've seen the data and the BSS segment, so data segments store initialized data, BSS segments store uninitialized data, and also the stack segment, which enables our stack to grow down when we call a function recursively. In addition, we need other memory cells. So in addition to main memory, uh, some other context is contained in processor registers. So when a compiler generates machine code out of your, for example, C program, uh, all the variables are usually assigned a memory location. Now, if you like do an execution of an addition, so you add two variables together and assign this to a third variable, then you have the problem that if you wanted to read these instructions, uh, these variables from memory, every time you needed them, your computer would get very slow. So what a compiler does is it tries to 
cache these values inside of processor registers. Now we have only have very few processor registers in the typical processor, so like 16 or 32. So there's not enough space for all variables in our program, in most common programs. So essentially these processor registers need to be preserved because they're just part of the data you're program is processing at this given moment. So we have general purpose registers, so they can hold values, so numbers, characters, or pointers. And we have a number of special registers, and the most common ones are the instruction pointers. So this tells our process and our CPU which instruction is the next one to execute. And we have the stack pointer, which tells us where our local context for our local function is located in memory, so it can access local variables using relative offsets from the stack pointer. And we have additional stuff like a process state. So we've already seen different process states and we'll go into a bit of more detail about this in a bit. Uh, we have maybe permissions uh, to determine what the process is enabled to do. This is related to its user ID, so which user has started the process. Some users may have more permissions to do things than other users. And of course also the currently used resources, so which files are open, at which read or write position in a file uh, is my process currently operating, which IO devices are used, and so on. And all of this information is represented inside of the kernel of the operating system, and that's a very central data structure and this central data structure is called the PCB or process control block. So this contains an entry, it's a large array, and in each of these array rows you have an entry consisting of a structure that's enabled to save uh, information about your memory segments, about your registers, about your user ID permissions, and so on. We'll give examples for this later when we look at this in more detail. So how can we think about processes executing? Now this depends on your view of a system. So here we have three views of a process, and these are just different views depending on what you're interested in. So the first view is multi-programming. So we start with a process A, maybe from that process A at some point in time we switch over to executing a process B. This process B decides to switch over to a process C. Process C goes to D, and after a while, process D switches back to process A, and process A now continues exactly where it left off the last time. So it doesn't start from scratch, but uh, the operating system needs to save this information where was A interrupted to switch to B, and then when it's its turn the next time, A can actually continue at exactly the point where it left off. So this is our technical view, maybe a processor view. So our processor doesn't know about processes, which is strange because of the name, right? So our processor just executes instructions one after the other and, well, maybe jumps somewhere like between A and B or B and C and something else. So essentially our processor only has one single instruction pointer which it uses. And then we have to perform the context switching, so changing the value of the instruction pointer to be able from, to switch from A to B, from B to C, and so on. This context switching has to be done by the operating system, and this is a multi-programming view which enables us to have the illusion of several programs executing at the same time, which they obviously don't, because we only have one instruction pointer in our CPU. The CPU, in a very simple case, can only execute one instruction at a time, so we're always inside of one given process at a time. When we look at the conceptual view, we don't want this control flow through the processes, but we actually want to know what's going on in our system all the time. So essentially, what processes are currently active in our system? So somebody has started them and they have not been terminated yet. So our conceptual view of our multi-programming setup would be, well, we have four processes, A, B, C, and D, and they're all running independently, so they all have their local state, which means they are executing somewhere, they, their program counter is somewhere when they were last able to run on the CPU, and, well, we can agree that these processes are independent because our operating system takes care of the isolation between the processes. So 
uh, if I just directly try to jump from process A into a function provided by process B, this usually would be a uh, would be uh, just uh, uh, yeah uh, hindered by the operating system. Uh, so in, a, in able to do this, we need some operating system interaction. So from the view of your program, your program just has a CPU all the time. And each of your processes thinks it has a CPU all the time. And to maintain this illusion, this, the operating system has to switch between these processes fast enough so they don't actually find out what's going on. So our process only knows about its own control flow and where it currently is executing inside of uh, its uh, program space, whereas our operating system has the global view of what's going on with our four, for example, processes here. Now we can also have a third view, which is a real-time view. So this is usually described using a so-called Gantt diagram, where we have a time axis, so your time increases to the right, and then you have uh, on the vertical axis several processes, and this diagram means that process A is executing for this amount of time shown on this line here. Then something switches over to process B, something else switches over to process C, and then to D, and then we'll start again at process A, and so on. So this, uh, similar to multiprogramming, indicates that only one process is active on a single processor system at any given point in time. But the CPU multiplexing using the GAT diagram also gives us some information about how much time each process actually is allowed to spend on a processor. And this is especially important for things like real-time embedded systems, where reaction times, like for anti-lock uh, anti brake systems in your car, are very important. Because uh, yeah, if your anti-lock brake system reacts too late when you're driving on a slippery road and you brake, you maybe uh, are uh, hitting a tree instead of just uh, staying in safety. So some of these analysis can get quite important and we'll have a closer look at a bit of real-time scheduling for CPUs later this semester. So how does a process behave and which states can a process be in? Now a process can be in one of several states and these states depend on what the process is trying to do or what the system is actually doing at the moment. So in a single processor system, we've seen only one process can be executed at the same time because our processor can only execute one and only, uh, and the single instruction at any given point in time. So there's always only one process that's currently running on the CPU. Let's say this is the green process, process A here at the moment. Now, what are all the other processes doing in this system when process A is running? They have to wait for something. Ideally, they can wait for the CPU to become available. So when process A, yeah, gives uh, gives off uh, gives up the CPU or is taken away the CPU, one of the other processes can actually change its state and then occupy the CPU. So when we look at this in this sort of Gantt diagram here, at the current moment. Uh, process A is running on the CPU and has been running for quite some time, whereas process B and process C are waiting. So these two states are simple. So they indicate that one process is running on the CPU and one or more other processes might want to use the CPU but have to wait until process A yeah, is no longer running on the CPU. But something else may happen that may actually restrict our process from uh, running on the CPU. So uh, this is our third state here, and this is our blocked state. And blocked means we're waiting for something else. So our process is waiting for something else than the CPU to become available. So even if the CPU would become available, it still cannot execute because it needs data that needs to be provided by something else, usually an input-output device of our system, which is in the most common cases orders of magnitude slower than our CPU. So if we are blocked, we're waiting for the completion of an I.O. operation here. If we are ready, we have all the resources we need to continue our execution except for the CPU, so we can change to running. And if we're running, two things can happen. So a running process can either decide to give up the CPU, 
so it goes back to ready. So either voluntarily or when its time slice has been used up and the operating system just changes its state. The other thing that can happen is that an operating system, uh, that a process, executes an I.O. operation. So then it moves from running to blocked because the OS knows an I.O. operation takes lots of time. So while this process A is executing an I.O. operation, another process can use the CPU. So we're moving A from running to blocked in this case. And we see this here. So A has been moved from running to blocked because it has executed this I.O. operation, which takes some time. And now the operating system figures out, okay, there was no running process. So it can choose another process, which is ready to run on the CPU. And that's exactly what happened here. So process C has been moved from ready to running. And this is what we call a context switch. So we are continuing to execute instructions, but these instructions now are no longer part of our process A, but instead they're now part of process C. And in between the operating system intervened to enable the switch over. So now C is running and B is still ready. Why is it C and not B? Well, the operating system has to choose. Some of these decisions can be made using priorities. Maybe C has had a higher priority. So if there's two processes in ready B and C, then C would come first, or it does some random choice or just ordering processes by the uh, sequence they came into ready state. So there are many ways and these scheduling algorithms will also occupy us for quite a bit in the term of this semester. So now we have the following situation. We have this point in time here, A has had the CPU for quite some time until it decided to execute an I.O. operation. And then the operating system actually moved C into the running state. And now C is running for quite some time on the CPU, whereas in the background, some I.O. operation like reading a file from disk is going on. So A has to wait until this is finished. So what else can happen? Well, uh, as I said, uh, processes usually not only voluntarily give up CPU time, but they went when they use the CPU for too long, actually they can be stopped or interrupted, suspended, or we call this preempted. So the operating system actually interferes using something we call an interrupt when the time slice of process C ends. So it has calculated for enough. So it has run the CPU for quite some time. And so the, uh, yeah, the operating system now decides some other process should be running. So we are still in blocked with process A. So this is a really long running IO operation. And now C has not executed an IO operation. So the only thing it would need to continue running is the CPU, but we just took it away from it. So now we could move B to running this was ready and moved C to ready. So we switched B and C here. So C was preempted because its time slice ran out. B is moved into running and can now be executed. So C has to wait for the CPU to get ready again, whereas I is still waiting for its long running IO operation to complete. So what happens when the IO operation finally ends? So we had the situation that we had A first, A started this I.O. operation. So the operating system chose C, which was ready as the next process. C was running for quite some time. So the CPU was taken away by the operating system and B was assigned the CPU. So B is now in the running state. So now while B is running and still has some time left over in its time slice, the I.O. operation completes. So now we have a problem because yeah, B is still using the CPU. So A cannot immediately continue using the CPU. And that would be pretty unfair. So if we would implement a method that actually directly gives the CPU to process A when an IO operation completes, then a process that does very many short IO operations would actually be able to monopolize the CPU. So it would be a CPU hog. And we want to avoid this. And in order to do this, a process that was in blocked state and has received the notification that its IO it was waiting on is completed is not directly moved back to running. So you see here's a missing arrow. So we can only go from running to blocked, but not directly back from blocked to running. So the only way we can go here is from blocked to ready. And this is 
yeah, this makes sense because the process was waiting for an I.O. operation and the CPU while it was in blocked. Now the I.O. operation is finished, so the only thing it needs to continue running is an available CPU. So we move this process from blocked to ready when its I.O. It's was waiting on is completed. And then the next time, when the next scheduling decision comes, it might have a chance to be selected again. So this is the asymmetry in our process state graph that we can move from running to blocked, but we cannot move back from blocked to running because that would be unfair. We can move from blocked to ready because that is the indication when our IO is complete, but we cannot move from ready to blocked because the ready process is not executing at the moment. So it cannot start a new IO operation. So it can only start a new IO operation whenever it's scheduled and then it has to go that way again. So a single scheduling algorithm, so a scheduling algorithm decides when which process actually gets to use the CPU. A single scheduling algorithm is characterized by the order of processes in a queue. So we've seen there can be more processes waiting in ready state like B and C at the beginning. And it's also characterized by the conditions under which the process processes are added to the queue. So we have a waiting queue of processes. Some of these are selected and are put on the CPU to be executed. So we change to a running state. These here are ready. And new tasks can be added to the queue when, for example, I start another program. So I click on another icon because I also want an MP3 player running in addition to my Firefox and my mail client. And the preempted tasks, so tasks that either run out of their time slice or over the busy state, go back into the queue and have to wait until they get, they get the CPU once again. And then tasks that are finished fall out of the queue. So these completed tasks, so when your program is ended, your MP3 player has finished playing your music, uh, then this task is completed and is no longer part of the scheduling in your system. So it's taken out of your process control uh, process table, uh, its process control block is deleted and so on. So this scheduling of the CPU enables the coordination of concurrent processes. We've seen concurrent processes is just an illusion we create, an abstraction, and the real concurrency only works when you have multiple processes which can have multiple instructions executed at the same time. So here we create the illusion of concurrency by just switching between processes fast enough so the user of that computer actually doesn't notice that we are switching between different, CP, uh, different processes. So the basic questions here are which sort of events can actually cause such a preemption and if we have a preemption event in which order should processes then be executed. And this really depends on what you want to do with your computer. So we can have very many different objectives of a scheduling algorithm and the two major classes of objectives are that a scheduling algorithm can be user oriented, for example in a desktop operating system like Windows or Mac OS, uh, you usually want short reaction times. So when you click on something, you want the computer to react immediately or it feels immediately to you at least. Whereas when you do like lots of batch processing, like running a web server or whatever, uh, your scheduling might be more system oriented. So you want to ensure optimal CPU utilization, for example, if you are doing lots of calculations. There are very many scheduling algorithms out there that have been proposed over the last five decades. No single scheduling algorithm can actually fulfill all the requirements of a computer and its users. So a scheduling algorithm actually has to choose some compromises. So when we have processes, we see, uh, we've seen that we have concurrent processes. So essentially, uh, if these processes somehow uh, make use of the same resource of a system, we have to take care that this works perfectly. So essentially we have to synchronize the processes so that these processes don't interfere with each, with each other. One nice example always is a non-coordinated access to a printer. So usually you would want a process to start its print job, print all its pages and then finish before the next process can start. And if you didn't enable this in your operating system, you can have a situation like this. So here you have two processes and because they are concurrent, the operating system switches between these processes from time to time. So 
This first process has three lines. It prints a line, hey Olaf, then it prints call me, then it prints a uh, phone number. And the other process prints uh, maybe a love letter, tour, I like you, whatever. And if these processes interfere, then it can happen that actually parts of the execution of these print statements are mixed up with another, and that would be the output you get. So, for example, uh, the first four characters might be printed by the first print statement in process A, so you get a hey, and then because every character is actually output using a sequence of machine instructions. So this print instruction is not atomic, so it can be interrupted in the middle. So right after outputting that space after the hey, uh, our operating system decides, oh, it's time to switch to process B. And process B starts off and prints tour. Yeah, great. And uh, well, then it decides after four characters, oh, let's switch back to process A. So process A was here. It has printed the first four characters, so it just continues and prints Olaf. Then it prints a return, and then can run for quite a bit, call me, and then we have a process switch again. And process B now gets to print on the printer again, and it prints I like you. Then process B uh, is switched away from again, and we switch back to process A, and process A prints a phone number. So what comes out is probably not what was intended, and that can cause a lot of confusion and we need to avoid this confusion because people would be very unhappy, obviously. So what can we do about this? Now, obviously, this piece of code, these three lines here, and these other two lines on the process B, they belong together. So it's important that they are executed without being interrupted by something else that tries to do almost the same thing. And this sequence of code which needs to be executed without interruption is called a critical section. And we need to protect this critical section so no other process can execute its own critical section when one critical section is already executed. So when we're somewhere in, where in here uh, between one of these print instructions and process A, process B that wants to print has to wait until we left this critical section and then it can use the printer. And this solution approach is called mutual exclusion. So either the one or the other process can be in its critical section, but not both at the same time. And what we're using for this is a, si a simple data structure called a mutex. So a mutex is a special type of variable. And this mutex actually has two operations. You can operate on that mutex. So here you see both process A and process B have the same mutex, which is an address in memory. So they have to share some memory location somewhere between themselves. And now a lock operation actually sets a value in that mutex that tells any other process that tries to execute a lock, ah, no, you have to wait until the other one is ready. And only when we arrive at unlock again, using the same mutex here, then this value is reset to its original value. So it indicates there's no critical section currently being executed. And lock here in process B has to wait until process A has executed unlock. And the other way around, of course, if process B would be the first one, it also has to lock its resource to print and to unlock it. So that's essentially the important part. Uh, we have to lock this critical section and all of the processes that try to use the resource, for example, our printer. And we do this in the most simple form using our mutex here. And the basic functions for operating on mutexes are lock and unlock, which is essentially like a lock to a door or something. So when you want to be undisturbed, you lock your door and nobody can come in until you unlock the door and maybe somebody else can lock the door afterwards. So one thing that can happen when you synchronize multiple processes is deadlocks. So here's a very nice graphical example for deadlocks. We have a crossroads here and we have four cars arriving at the crossroads at the same time. So you might know this traffic rule here, left yields to right. So uh, a car at the, uh, that's coming from the right side of you, if you don't have any traffic lights or traffic signs at this intersection, uh, actually has the right of way. Now let's look uh, what uh, how this works out in our situation here. So let's look at this car first. So this driver is looking to the right. It says, oh, there's another car, so I need to wait for that car. Okay, so the next driver then checks, is there a car to the right of me? Oh, damn, yeah, there is a car to the right of me, so I'll also have to wait. Now the third car, the driver, well, 
He looks to his right and ah, uh, there's another car. So this driver also has to wait. And the fourth driver again looks to his right and oh, now there's another car. So none of the cars is allowed to proceed. And actually this is some of the reasons like in unprotected intersections on routes. If something like this happens, people react incorrectly because they misunderstand each other. But in general, if all people follow the routes, we have a deadlock because if you just follow the traffic rules, none of these cars is allowed to proceed. Now, obviously, there are precautions in real life traffic laws uh, for this uh, for situations like these. So you have to communicate uh, and something like this. But in general, if we just follow this simple rule, we'd have a deadlock. So our system would come to a halt. None of these cars would be able to proceed on its way. So uh, the same can happen to your processes. And if this happens to your process, well, you just wonder, and nothing's working, I don't get a printout, what else is going wrong, I don't get any network packets through. And deadlocks are a really difficult thing to, de uh, to detect. We'll go into details about deadlocks later on in the course. And one of the important things you have to take care about when designing operating system kernels. So when you want to communicate things between concurrent processes. We've already seen a very simple method for communication, this mutex. That's essentially just a memory location in which we can write a value to lock or unlock something. But maybe we want to exchange more information than just essentially a bit that tells us if a resource is currently used or unused or if we're in a critical section or not. And uh, more general methods for interprocess communication enable the col uh, collaboration of multiple processes. For example, you might have a printing daemon. So there's one program that actually controls the printer. And there's, uh, if you have a text processing software or graphics program that wants to print something, it has to communicate with this printing daemon in order to get something printed. And the printing daemon can then take care of the order and the completion of things. Or on Unix system, you have the graphical window system, the X window system. So the whole screen is actually controlled, the, your bitmap screen, by one program, which is called the X window server. And all the programs you start, like uh, yeah, a drawing program like GIMP or Inkscape, or a web browser like Firefox, they all have to communicate with the X window server in order to get access to a part of the screen, so to their windows, and in order to be able to draw something there and to get input from the keyboard. We can also have remote interprocess communication. So the first two examples were local. Remote interprocess communication is what you probably use every day. So con connecting your web client to a web server, connecting to a database server and retrieving some data, connecting to an FTP server uh, to retrieve some files. So these are typical client server systems over the internet. Uh, we are usually not that much concerned with remote systems. So our operating systems we consider here mostly are running on a local machine only, but of course there are also distributed operating systems you can use. And to enable programming uh, for interprocess communication, the operating system provides a number of abstractions again. And the most uh, important abstractions here are shared memory. So shared memory means that multiple processes use the same memory location or area at the same time, like we've seen with our locks. And this requires additional synchronization. And the other option is message passing. So message passing uses what we call copy semantics, in which a recipient doesn't have direct access to the message inside of another process, but it receives a copy of that message. And this message passing can be synchronous. So whenever I send a message, I cannot continue until I receive the reply from the other party, I would try to communicate it with, or it can be asynchronous. So just send off stuff and I'll get notified later if there's any reply and I could do something else in between. So what's the next thing our operating system has to administer? Now, memory is of course one important thing, one important, very important component of our computers. And we've already seen the memory hierarchy a bit in our lecture uh, talking about hardware resources. So we've seen we have very fast and small memories like registers or caches usually on the CPU chip. We have main memory like ROM, RAM and flash memory, which are on your PCB. So on your uh, printed circuit board, your computer is made of. 
And then you have external storage like background storage, like hard disks and SSDs, which are usually built into your computer. And then you can have removable media like tapes, DVDs, or USB memory sticks that you can attach and remove. And finally, you can have network storage. So you can, uh, for example, use Dropbox to access your files that are somewhere stored on the Dropbox server. So that would be sort of cloud, cloud storage. And the properties of this memory hierarchy is uh, on top are the smallest memories, on the bottom are probably the largest memories, so capacity increases from top to bottom. Access time unfortunately also increases, so registers are very fast, caches are also pretty fast, and you probably know well accessing something over the network and the cloud can be pretty slow. Now the good thing is that the cost also decrease, decreases when we go down, so registers are very expensive, that's why we only have so few of them, whereas network storage can be pretty cheap or maybe even free for some gigabytes. And this only works and is efficient due to the so-called locality principle, which makes use of the fact that a program uses a, only a small part of the data it processes and the instruction it processes for most of the time. So this is a temp uh, the spatial locality and a program that executes something and accesses data is very likely to access the same data or instructions again very soon. So this is temporal locality. So this enables this caching system and our memory hierarchy actually to work. So all this memory has to be managed in a way. So what we want to avoid is we want to have our main memory just split up between a number of programs A, B, and this should be a C here down. Uh, and then when another program has to be started, we need to fit it in there. And we would uh, need to start yet another program. Maybe the sum of free memory might be big enough to store it, but you won't find a section of memory that's contiguous that's actually big enough to hold your program. So what we are doing is we provide something we call address mapping. So we provide another abstraction or illusion, which tells a process that, oh, you have control over all the memory of your computer. Like in the 32-bit system, this is 2 to the 32 bytes, so 4 gigabytes. In reality, it's a bit less, uh, but we'll discuss about the uh, real implementation details uh, a bit later. And uh, so these addresses are Pro process actually sees are not the real addresses in main memory. And this means there has to be some sort of translation. We've already seen this sort of translation is done by the memory management unit. And uh, as a consequence, the pages, memory pages our program consists of, can be somehow scattered and distributed over the physical memory. And the MMU, together controlled by the operating system, creates the illusion that we have contiguous memory region for each single process. So this not only enables this, uh, this view, it also enables us to reallocate code and data if you have to move something around. Uh, but still, for uh, accessing main memory, we need to find a placement strategy. So if you have an additional program you want to start, we need to find a gap in our memory uh, to put process D in. And the question is, can we actually compact the memory? Can we move some of these programs around now? Because their physical addresses are no longer related to the addresses the program thinks it's using. And can we minimize the fragmentation? So uh, the effect that very small unused parts are somewhere in between. That's something if you have used MS-DOS before, maybe you know uh, you had to defragment your hard disk every now and then to get up to speed again. That's very similar, just it goes a bit faster in RAM. And of course, if we're running out of memory, the operating system has to decide which memory area can actually be swapped in. Like if we needed more memory, we could maybe decide that parts of program B no longer need to reside in memory, so we can save them, for example, to disk and retrieve them when we need them later. So this is all pretty complex, uh, but this enables us to use the computers we know today. So in addition to main memory, we have background storage. And background storage provides us with yet another abstraction. So what our computer actually provides is just a bit of storage hardware. Here, for example, we have a hard disk with six surfaces. So a hard disk consists of platters made of, for example, aluminum or glass. And these are coated with some magnetic material, essentially rust. 
Rust can be magnetized in one or the other direction, storing a 0 or a 1-bit, and this is done by the read-write heads here, and you have one writing and reading on top, and the other on the bottom, and then you have three disks, so you have six surfaces overall. And these surfaces are in turn split into sectors, so you can move the arms in and out here to reach another sector, and uh, these sectors are again split into, uh, no, uh, sorry, these were tracks, of course, moving in and out, and these tracks are split into sectors, so a sector is one part of one of the circles on one of the surfaces here. So if you need to access such a sector, you would give the hard disk the information, oh, I want information from head 3, track 17, sector 52. So if your, pro uh, if your program you're writing really needed to access the hard disk on that level, you would probably go crazy, and there would be no way of coordinating these successes if some other process just decided, oh, I also want to write to, you know, head 3, uh, track 17, sector 5, or so on. So we need a very convenient abstraction to make life easier for you, for your programs that want to read and write data. And this is the so-called file system. So file systems actually provide a mapping from a very abstract logical view. This is a tree of directory names. So directory is like uh, yeah, a drawer you can put something into. And inside of directories, you can have additional directories. And inside of a directory, you can also have files. And these files are obviously what you want to work with, like this PDF file down here. And to get to this PDF file, you start at the root. So every file system has a start, it's a root. Then uh, you find out, OK, it's in a directory or folder called home. And then it's in a subdirectory of home, so a directory inside of another directory, which is called me. And inside of that directory, there's finally a file, which is called OSPDF. And what the operating system does, it creates the illusion of all these logical directory levels and files and provides a mapping. For example, if we want to read OS.PDF, it can tell the hard disk which sectors on which head in which uh, track actually to read in which sequence in order to retrieve all the data that is part of our OS PDF file. So the OS provides a logical view to the applications and there's lots of translation going on until we end up at the hard disk, but we want to be able to access our data efficiently and fast, so the operating system has to do this very efficiently. So the next point we need to talk about when talking about operating system is security. So security is very important. Very early systems provided almost no security, so each user of the system was able to access each and every program and data on the system. That works well as long as all people know each other. It's a small group of people they are working together on a project. But you probably like uh, don't want any student uh, to read your private email on a server or something like that. So essentially, uh, if a computer is used by multiple persons, and these multiple persons are not necessarily uh, yeah, biological persons. They can also be some other task, like a JavaScript code you downloaded from a website inside of your web browser. You don't want that JavaScript code to access your bank account information, obviously. So uh, even on a single user system, but even more on multi-user systems, you need to protect data from unauthorized access. Access can mean you have different operations on objects like files. These operations can be read, so you read the contents, you can write a whole file or parts of a contents, you can even delete something, or you can execute something. So for example, you wrote a great program which provides results to you and you only, and you don't want anyone else to use it, so you only want to allow uh, yourself to execute the program. So on the one hand, we have subjects, so the persons who uh, want to have rights or want to execute their rights. So these can be persons which are represented by users on a computer, but also processes like Firefox executing JavaScript code. And then you have objects that these subjects want to access. This can be data like files, uh, these can be devices, these can be other processes, this can be regions of memory. And the question the operating system has to ask at each and every of these operations that are occurring is, is this operation, given the subject that is trying to do this operation and the object that it is trying to access, is this actually permitted? And in order to figure this out, 
the operating system consults this so-called access matrix. So in the various columns, we have the objects of our system. So for example, we have a column for each file in our system, whereas in the rows of our access matrix, we have the subjects. So this might be a user, this might be another user. And essentially at the intersection of a column and a row, we can store the permissions. So we can say subject A has a read permission to object B, but maybe it doesn't have a read permission to object C. So this is a very basic model and in Unix it's realized to implement file and process attributes. So uh, the properties related to a user realized by Unix imply for which user the process is being executed. So the operating system keeps track of which user has started a process. And in Unix, there's also ways to change the user ID of the running process. Uh, we'll also talk about this later. For files, the operating system needs to keep track of which user is the owner of a file. So the owner of a file usually has control over all the access permissions to that file. And uh, the properties related to user also include which permission the owner of a file gives to any other user or to himself or herself uh, for accessing this file. So I might want to have full access, read and write uh, for myself, but I want others only to be able to read a certain file. So these permissions of a process when accessing a file are determined by the attribute of a process. So the process has a user ID it is executing under uh, usually the user that started that process and the attribute of a file has an owner ID that actually determined who is currently uh, in control over the access rights or access permissions of that file. And so, for example, we can figure out for user2, which is the process running under the ID of user2, which tries to access file2. It's only allowed to read, so if it's reading, our operating system permits it. If it tries to write, it will uh, receive an error message and no write operation can be performed. And then the uh, program needs to figure out what to do in this case. So Unix success permissions are pretty simple because they were based on very simple hardware. So Unix implements a very simple form of access control lists. Every process in Unix has a user ID and in addition a group ID. So each user can belong to one or multiple groups. And files also have an owner and a group. So permissions to access a file are grouped into, two, into three groups. So permissions the owner of that file allows himself to use. For example, uh, we want to write protect the file even for ourselves because we don't want any changes to that file. So we would take away the owner's write permission as the owner ourselves. Uh, we can grant or deny permissions to the group we're in or to one of the groups we're in. And then there are all others in the system which are not part of the group. So all the others can also get a separate uh, set of uh, permissions for our file. So let's say we have a file, file.tash here, and then we have three bits indicating permissions. So let's say that is my file here. So I'm the user owning that file, I'm Michael. So I allow myself to read that file and write that file but I don't allow myself to execute that file because it's a text source file that doesn't make sense to execute. Now all the other people in my group, let's say this is a staff group, I want them to be able to read the file so they can monitor my progress, but I don't want them to monitor my, uh, to, to make changes to whatever my PhD thesis, for example, if I would write one. So others are only allowed to read, but they're not allowed to write, and of course not to execute. So these are the others in my group. And all the other users, which are not myself or part of my group, they are not allowed anything. Those, so they're denied read, write, and execute because I don't want them to look at my file. I don't want them to modify my file. And of course, I don't want them to execute my file. So file attributes are in groups of three, one bit for read, one bit for write, one bit for execute. Each of them can be true or false or yes or no. And these groups relate to the owner of the file, so myself in this case, the group I'm in, and all the others in the system. Now, if we consider modern computers, we have a number of additional things to consider. 
So one of the things we briefly mentioned when discussing architecture is that we can now have multiple processors. And if we have these multiple processors and only one shared main memory, then we have a bottleneck when all of these processors need to access the memory at the same time. So some of these processors will have to wait longer. So one of the solutions to make these systems faster is to have a local main memory for all of the CPUs in our system. So this is an example system with a couple of AMD processors. We have four CPUs here. These CPUs are connected using a fast interconnect called hypertransport, and they have a local interconnect to their own local DRAM. And we've seen this in the architecture lecture that we can actually easily distinguish the set of memory DIMMs belonging to a single CPU. So we have four CPUs and four sets of main memory. And in addition, we have some connection, maybe only from one CPU using hypertransport to a PCIe bridge. So this is a bus system that connects high speed peripherals like your GPU in your system and your disk controller and so on. So essentially, uh, even if you have fast main memory accesses, all the IO accesses might have been, uh, might have to go through one of the CPU's hypertransport links here. But since the I.O. is quite a bit slower than main memory and CPU communication, this usually works out well. So we have a global address space. So even though each CPU has its own memory, each CPU can access other CPU's memories using this hypertransport link, but the latency is higher. So if I access my own local memory as CPU 4 here, I'm fast. And if I need to go through CPU 1 to ask it for its memory contents, well, that will take some time. But this approach has advantages. It enables better scalability. We have parallel memory accesses from all of the CPUs that are possible now, so we don't have to wait for that long. And if we have such a multiprocessor system, we also need to decide how to allocate CPUs. We've seen our ready list before when we discussed scheduling. And now let's say we have four CPUs here. And what the operating system can do is, for example, it can implement a single common ready list. So all of the processes that are ready are in one big list. And then when a CPU becomes available because the process running on that CPU either gave up the CPU or was uh, preempted, then the uh, operating system can select the first process in our queue here and allocate it to one of the CPUs that actually became free. The other option is to actually uh, yeah, administer your process waiting lists per CPU. So essentially you queue your processes into one of the queues belonging to one of the CPUs. So now when one of these CPUs becomes free, because the process again uh, has uh, no longer is no longer using the CPU, then the first re uh, ready process in this ready list actually gets uh, assigned the CPU and all the others uh, are not eligible for using on that for, uh, for running on that first CPU. So uh, some of this may be more efficient here, some of this may be more efficient in other situations, depending on things like cache configurations and so on. And we'll also discuss this later in the semester because here we're just giving an overview of the challenges the operating system has to perform and which abstractions it's performing then. Uh, so finally, we also have cloud computing. So uh, clouds have a number of properties according to a document written by the US National Institute of Standards and Technologies. So clouds have additional challenges to the operating system uh, running the cloud systems. So it needs to be self-service. So a user using a cloud needs to be able to spin up some service on the cloud without asking an operator or administrator. You need high throughput network access, obviously, because the cloud is somewhere else. So people say there is no cloud, it's just another person's computer, and that can be on the opposite side of this planet. So it might take some time for data to get there. So high throughput network access is essential. Then your cloud needs to be able to scale. So you need to have a resource pool. You have, need to have some reserve resources that are available in, course, in case uh, some new user wants to use your cloud. You need to be able to adapt rapidly. So if there are load changes, because, for example, there are, uh, yeah, whatever, you have a special offer when you're running a web shop. And now, instead of 100 customers at the same time, you have 1,000 customers at the same time. So you need to be able to scale up and adapt and also scale down again when this rush has passed. And you need to be able to measure this because cloud systems cost money. So you need to find out, do you get the performance, the network throughput, the compute performance 
uh, you actually want or require for the money you pay for it. So in able to uh, ensure this flexibility for cloud computing, uh, hardware provides features that create another illusion. So this creates the illusion of having multi uh, multiple physical computers available on one single real machine. And this is called virtualization here. So we can virtualize our hardware uh, and by creating these multiple virtual machines on one physical computer, we can run multiple, even different operating systems at the same time on one machine. And we create the illusion for each of these operating systems that it has complete control over the computer while it hasn't. So this is an important foundation technology for cloud computing and for server consolidation. So you can easily add a virtual machine instead of just, just you know, put an additional physical server in the rack you might have to buy before when you need some additional compute performance. And the technical basis for this are hypervisors, also called virtual machine monitors. And you see that there are two different types of hypervisors. The one is running directly on top of the hardware and provides these illusions to different Windows or Linux guest OSs in this case. So the application processes of the guest OS are top he on top of here. Uh, this is, for example, uh, VMware ESX or the Zen hypervisor, whereas the Type 2 hypervisor is running as a regular process under a host operating system. So the host operating system can run its own processes in parallel. And then inside of that hypervisor, which runs as a more or less normal operating system process, you can run more, one or more guest operating systems, which then each have their own application processes running on top. So uh, this is, for example, regular VMware or VirtualBox or Linux KVM. These are typical type two hypervisors. So we've given a quick overview of the challenges of the abstractions and uh, the tasks of an operating system. So to conclude, the operating system has to administer resources. Some of these especially important are the CPU and the memory. And to do this, it provides abstractions, for example, process concepts, files and directories and security abstractions like permissions. Uh, very often an operating system is optimized for a specific application profile like a server or desktop or mobile operating system. And we've seen these uh, requirements are actually contradictory. So it's impossible to satisfy the requirements of all applications perfectly. Uh, we can approach this goal using virtualization. You might wonder like, ah, but I know Linux runs on all systems from a tiny Raspberry Pi and maybe uh, my mobile phone up to big mainframes. But this is just uh, an indication that Linux is very much configurable and you can optimize it using different objectives. So even if it's the same source code you're basing your systems on, this source code is configured differently and the runtime is configured differently in order to fulfill different objectives. So operating systems, typical applications, and of course the hardware have evolved together during the last five or six decades. And we have a set of system abstractions today we're going to talk about. These are the result of this evolution, but this evolution hasn't stopped. This evolution is still ongoing. One challenge, for example, is heterogeneous computing, where we need to schedule tasks not only on CPUs, but on GPUs, on FPGAs, on special accelerators for neural networks, and so on. So these all have very different properties in terms of throughput, of memory, uh, and so on. So an operating system has to be extended in order to efficiently make use of this tool. So with this, I want to close today's lecture. Uh, thanks for listening. And we'll dig a bit deeper into one of the most important instructions, the process abstraction, uh, in the next lecture. Thanks for listening. And until next time. <laughs>